Um, okay. Okay. All right. Uh, so let's get started. So uh, here, uh, Alex is going to present the workshop on reinforcement learning shortly. And uh, let me introduce Data Cabinet to you uh, quickly. So Data Cabinet is an online uh, platform where you can keep your notebooks and uh, environments. So you can um, keep full uh, Anaconda environments on the cloud directly. And uh, it, is, it makes it very easy to share. And we are working towards making it uh, more, uh, making it uh, uh, a more uh, easily shareable and uh, um, uh, and versionable environment for data science code bases. So um, uh, and uh, so Alex will get started with the uh, uh, with the um, uh, class now. And uh, if you have any setup problems, please uh, write on the YouTube channel, and uh, Abhishek and I will be looking at them. Thanks. So uh, Alex, all over to you. Okay, uh, I should be unmuted now. So anyway, uh, Data Cabinet, I agreed to help with this because I thought it was fairly interesting. Um, some of the headaches involved with, well, both deep learning and reinforcement learning is that you have to, uh, well, sometimes it's a bit of a headache, uh, like installing TensorFlow, getting it to work with the GPUs, and then uh, getting OpenAI to work, and then just all the, geez, I mean, it's, um, there's a lot of, work involved with not a lot of actual deep learning or reinforcement or playing around with reinforcement learning and the hope was that um, well first of all that all these dependencies are installed for you and also that you would have uh, let's say you're working remotely or uh, with a computer that doesn't exactly have a lot of uh, computational power um, well of course uh, the nice thing about data cabinet is that you can well, it's, it's a remote server and actually run your simulations and tests and you can, um, you can run your learning, your reinforcement learning algorithms to develop better policies uh, online. Um, and you can just let that happen without sort of being stuck at home with your GPU server or whatever. Um, but anyway, so I'm going to get started and um, I'm not going to be in an in-depth theoretical discussion of uh, reinforcement learning. I want to cover a few basics, but I think uh, in order, if we were to do it sort of in a full course format, um, it would take a lot longer and um, it would be more difficult for people to just get their hands. And some people prefer learning just by doing, and hopefully this will be a, a just introduce, get, getting people exposed to using uh, OpenAI, I guess in this case through Data Cabinet, so you can just play around with it and uh, uh, play around with environments and then um, hopefully we can just discuss some, at the very end we'll discuss a few rudimentary ways of um, developing, well, we'll talk about, we'll explain these terms later, but uh, a value function, a state action, value function, a state action value function, and then uh, generally creating policies based off that to uh, policies. So, um, but anyway, that's a lot of terms. So um, I'm going to sort of get started here. Um, now, one of the interesting things about deep learning, especially when I started learning about it, well, I first started, I first heard about it more, um, well, the big example that I heard other than more toy examples was AlphaGo last year, although it seems in deep learning research terms, that's, that feels like a decade ago. Um, but so here, Go people have studied for thousands of years and, um, and people have to go to, I guess, to become a Go master, you have to go to schools and you have to have all this formal learning and you have to study it for decades. And this, and it's not like they're just studying it. This is based off of thousands of years of knowledge of Go. But they were able to surpass that, or, or DeepMind was able to surpass that uh, using, well, 
reinforcement learning. And then that sounds very interesting because, um, because well, learning itself is a pretty interesting concept. And then you, if um, hopefully most of you have some exposure to deep learning and, and then you start getting into that. And then you learn that, or at least the way you start out is you learn about uh, some simple, well, you learn mostly about image classification and, I, and maybe later there on RNNs and natural language, uh, natural NLP. NLP. And image classification, it sounds, it looks kind of fancy. The models are pretty complex, but in reality, it's it's just a very complex function. It's a, I mean, you have a lot of non-linearities stacked on top of each other, but all you're doing is taking some input and you have some parameters for, for your function and it spits out an output. And it doesn't feel like learning in the sense of Go or like learning how to walk or uh, play games. And that's more of our intuition of learning. And so I guess what I'm trying to say is that when we think about learners are actually closer to reinforcement learning, because that's when we're learning behaviors or how to act or how to behave in certain situations. Uh, with certain objectives. So then the next question is, okay, so image classification, it's, pure, it's pretty um, obvious what your goal is. You're trying to match some sort of output as closely as possible. So what is your objective in reinforcement learning? And um, that's actually, I mean, that's not the question. Um, and I guess for reinforcement learning, they took this idea from operant conditioning um, that you have, um, well, you have a somebody, you do, you have a, you do, uh, you, and then you get a reward, or maybe you get no reward, and eventually you get rewards for the behaviors that you want, and then and then eventually you start acting that way. So like if you're training a dog, if you want it to sit up, then you give it treats whenever it's it's up, and then eventually it will do that. Um, and that's, I believe, the psychological service operant conditioning. And in reinforcement learning, um, so you you need you. The idea is that you're trying to maximize, and um, I guess what are we maximizing over? Uh, the is well. For, first of all, you're maximizing rewards not just for one time step. But you, um, the way they, de they define is that they're maximizing rewards over all future time steps. And it's actually, you don't have to accept that. Um, the idea, well, in the next slide, but you're, the idea is that you're maximizing future rewards. And one example is you just add, you start at a certain time step and you're, you're trying to modify your, be your behavior so that if you add up all of your rewards up to infinity, then it's going to be max, then it's going to be as high as possible. Um, I don't know. It's it's mathematically it's, it seems okay, but you can think about that yourself whether you you feel that's fair or not. And um, I guess I, for a few examples for rewards, you could. Well, the other thing is that you have to have some sort of options because if you just have only one option, you're just going to pick the same option and get the same reward. So that doesn't really help. So in, in this case, what we're saying is that your options are, we, we call them actions in, in a certain state, then you have different choices that you can make. And for example, if, or if well, in robotics, if you have, uh, I guess you have different joint angles and you have different amounts of forces that you can apply. And for humans, they have something very similar. And your objective might be, I want to walk as far as possible. Or if you're learning how to throw a ball, it might be like, I want to hit this target as accurately as possible. Or, um, and that might be your objective and your, and your control is based off of your like joints and power and things like that. Uh, another example might be if you're picking stocks, then your choices could be the stocks that you're, like what some small amount of stock buying out of a selection of N. Or it could be moves in a board game, like it could be uh, you're playing checkers or chess or go. And, uh, or you could be doing some sort of simpler environment, or you could be playing an Atari game and you, or you could be playing a game and you have controllers, you have uh, buttons you can press, um, you could have movement, some controller for movements, and that, that combination of them will be your actions. Um, let me see if there are any questions or no. Okay. So, anyway, explicitly, we are maximizing future rewards over future time steps. And again, there are examples um, in terms of this time series. Um, 
you could think of it as uh, slot machines um, in reinforcement learning. They call this uh, uh, the, the multi-arm bandit problem. You could have a whole bunch of slot machines and you're trying to figure out which ones and you can pull a lever for each slot machine and get some sort of stochastic reward or stochastic means random. It's not determined. It's not, sometimes you'll get a good reward. Sometimes you get no reward. Um, so anyway, for, for slot machines, uh, the, your problem might be which, um, which slot machine you pull each time. So you maximize your rewards because some slot machines might be more biased. Some slot machines may have more favorable rewards than other ones. Or in the stock market case, I could be, um, at each time step, I could be picking, um, a stock and I'm trying to maximize uh, the total value of my portfolio. Okay. And so that so that's a long talk about rewards, but hopefully it makes sense. If it doesn't, then I guess people can ask questions. Um, another important thing, at least if you read reinforcement um, learning literature is the idea of discounted rewards and that is that if you have infinite time steps and you have uh, and you're adding up rewards well you might add up to infinity and that's not great so um, it means it sort of makes your idea of future rewards like unbounded and meaningless so what they tend to do is in those cases is, is that they discount the rewards by a factor of gamma which is less than one so it'll be geometrically decreasing the value of or for, for future time steps so for example if you, the you'll discount the time step for um the value of the rewards for the next time step by gamma and the next one by gamma squared and so on um and so mathematically, this is great because it, it, it works out very nicely in terms of formulas and Bellman equation. But as, does that make sense? Um, and this isn't—I mean, you don't. This isn't as at, at, for in terms of what we're trying to do today. It's not that important because we're going to, be, going to be dealing more with situations where there's finite rewards, so we don't have to worry about that. But I just wanted to discuss it briefly. But you don't have to worry too much about it for now. Um, but a few interpretations for discount rewards is that we can discount rewards from for future actions. Well, we can say, think that the reward that we get for our action right now is going to be more important than the, the, our, the reward from um, um, our choice two or three time steps from now. And in terms of the stock market, then that sort of makes sense in terms um, from the idea of uncertainty that you'd rather have money now than, than have money later because you know something might happen so it's more volatile although um and you can think for yourself whether you believe that's true or not i mean because because technically volatility has can be built in to to um to your reinforcement learning models in a different way but that's one general interpretation of it um another interpretation is that if you well if you think about it in terms of a geometric sum then um well, if you add one gamma and gamma squared and so on, it's, it adds up to one over one minus gamma. So it's sort of like having one over one minus gamma time steps. Um, and the third, and the third interpretation, which uh, interesting research paper, which I'll try to find the link for it later, it's that it turns out. Well, they they made a they had a lot of uh, research papers which assumed that. Um, that your average reward over time step is going to be that is going to be equivalent to using uh, discounted rewards, and they eventually proved that sometime in the early two thousands, um, assuming that your um, distribute that your state distribution converges to a stationary state, um, and I'm going to talk about the, what those terms mean a little bit later. Um, So I, I, I was hoping to make this as simple as possible in terms of, well, to have as few of these concepts as possible before we dove into um, um, at least playing around with the, uh, with the data cabinet environments or the open AI gym environments. And here's a picture of um, most of the important pieces. And so what you have is in most, for reinforcement learning models, you will have an environment and, and an agent. And the agent is what is 
making the choices and what is deter what is choosing the actions and the environment is basically everything else so once you choose an end the environment will be will um act based off of that and i guess um it will change in a certain way um and you're starting the environment has a certain state s of t at the time step t and then once you take once you take a certain action um a of t uh this picture doesn't have it but in this case you you you'll choose a policy based off of a certain policy um given a certain state you'll choose a certain action and then the action will go is your action will affect the environment and the environment will change to a new state s of t plus one and it will also feed you back a reward um r of t plus one um or r of t or r of t plus one and um something that it, especially in the case of uh the, the open ai environments you don't actually um you'll get observations which are different from states um and basically it might be for an atari game the state might be the memory of the atari game the observation is not going to is going to be maybe the pixels of um that the atari game emulator is showing you and um and yeah so these are the important comp components and if it's pretty important that you have well you're sort of comfortable with these concepts and we'll go over some examples so it'll become a more apparent um, but hopefully you can go back to this picture and um, it should become um it'll feel you'll feel very comfortable with it and this is just for a one time step of course like you you'll what will happen is that you'll do for each time step you'll take an action get a reward and so on and so on and so on um are there any questions okay mostly technical questions um and just to explain some of the terms better because i just sort of threw them out there uh for an environment um it's like what i mentioned before for an environment there is a you can distinguish between an environment state and an, and an agent state and the environment state might be the atari game emulate um, or the emulator's memory um or if it's the universe it could be some sort of uh i don't know maybe there is a godlike being controlling everything and he has um he, and he has access to knowing what, what the exact state of the universe is um in a lot of robotics models this will be um this can be determined a uh, if you have a robot it will be uh, maybe the positions of objects and also the joint angles and um of and the velocities of the robot that's very common for uh um for physical systems for reinforcement learning and on the other side so that's the environment state and that's this idea of, of absolute knowledge and on the other side there's the agent state and um you can think of this in terms of the agent does not necessarily know the absolute state of the universe but they will know um what they might know instead is that they will know all their all the observations up to that point and all the actions they've taken up to that point and all the rewards up to that point and they and if you if you see the exact same thing um that's all the information that the if you're the agent and you and you, you have the exact same operate uh, observations and you take the exact same actions and you get the exact same rewards you can't tell if that's um if that environment is is going to be any different from um well you can't distinguish it because that's all the information that you have so based off of that information you're going to be making decisions on on what action to take more um that's more of the concept of the agent state and um and of course observations aren't necessarily states um i could give some examples but i'm not going to go into that but if you but i will say that if you take all your previous history of all, of all your uh, previous observations actions and rewards um so in this case starting with state zero action zero reward zero action one state action one reward one and so on then 
if you, that will encapsulate all the information that you need to make to take the next actions. And in theory, you could actually the dense way you could do that. And you probably don't know need to know you know the entire history of what happens uh, to make optimal decision. I feel there's another important point there, but. Um, Oh yeah, it's that in most situ in most cases for like Atari games, what they actually do is that they're going to be using. They tend to use something like they'll take the last four frames of the observations and they'll and they'll define that as your as enough information to determine your state. So they'll use the last four observations as the agent state. Or you could, um, uh, I think I talk about it later. Anyway. Any questions? Maybe I'm not scrolling down enough. I'm just going to check out the YouTube comments. Nope. Okay. Okay. So let me log into Data Cabinet. And um, I had an updated version of the examples, but of the environment examples but mostly it's going to be the same. While well, I'm waiting for this to load a little. Okay. So if you look at the, <coughs> sorry, if you look at the OpenAI uh, documentation, um, it will mention a few basic commands and we'll be seeing these over and over again. And the first, the first command is, uh, or the first line is going to be something like, you define your environment variable, your OpenAI environment variable, through Jim dot makes, and then um, the name of some OpenAI. OpenAI has a bunch of different environments in, in this case, and we can choose one of them. It could be Carpool V zero, and that will um, load a certain OpenAI environment. And then, okay. And then next, uh, you need to. We want to reset it to some initial state, and the command for that is in, is uh, once you define your environment variable, so it's going to be whatever that's called. In this case, it's called env, and, and you call env dot reset, and that will return the uh, the initial observation. Um, and then you can use the render command, and that will—that is the default method for rendering the environment. So, it, for a lot of text-based examples, it will just give you a little picture of what's going on. Um, unfortunately, well, for since we're since I want to give examples in the Jupyter notebooks, it, well, the problem is that Jupyter notebook. In, in a lot of cases, uh, the render command will pop out, uh, create a pop out window, um, but this doesn't work in Jupyter Notebook, so we had to do some workarounds for this. Um, but we already have them ready for you. So, for example, here I'm importing my commands. And now, so like I mentioned, Jim Make, we're, we're, we're loading the breakout. It's a it's a little game where you have a paddle and you're you're trying to create um, bounce a ball off the paddle to hit blocks and each time you hit the block you destroy them and you, you get some points and um, so what we, what we did instead was that we used MATLAB plot and um, and we created a window in we sort of we put the rendering into the MATLAB plot and displayed it for a few pixels at a time. And so this is all this is replacing environment.render. Um, so this is all basically MATLAB plot stuff. And um, you don't have to worry about that. But then the next part is that we need to choose an action. At each time step, we need to choose some sort of action to take. Uh, in this case, it's going to move the pedal like left or right in some way. Um, and for this example, we're just going to take a random action, a completely random action. Out of all the possible actions, we're just taking uh, uniform random sampling. 
through uh, M through M dot action space and and the sample function command. And this works for both discrete and continuous cases. And after that, you just have to take uh, you you run the step function and feed it the, the action, and it will um, and then it will take the next step. And then we're we're, we're iterating it. Uh, I think about a hundred times. Um, hopefully this shows up well on YouTube, but but anyway, as as you can see, so this is completely random. Um, it's not it's just moving. It's not moving back based off of the image. What what we can do later is that we can actually take a convolutional neural network, feed in the observations, and then based off of that, um, we can teach it to try to um, use the well use the image to determine which way it should move. Um, but anyway, so you saw that was it's pretty nifty that. That I, we can actually get this to work in uh, Jupyter Notebook, and it's not doing very well um, because it's completely random. Sometimes it does hit it, but whatever. <laughs> and uh, this is pretty. This is pretty important, especially if you're programming this. Um, so here we're going to. You can another command that you can do is that you can. Um, you can. You can, you can use observation space and action space, and that will define what um, it will define. Well, the observation space and the action space, and box is going to be it's actually an array, so it says box two two ten one sixty three, and what this means is that it's well, it's it's just the pixels, so it's a two hundred it's a two ten by one sixty uh, picture, and it has its art. And just like in most convolutional neural, red, green, and blue, so it's going to have a depth of three uh, for each color. And the action space is discrete four, so there's four possible actions it can take, and it will choose uh, whenever you take an action. Like if you take sample, it will choose one of those, so it's a one-hot vector. Um, and I, I'm mentioning this because, well, we'll get in, we'll, we'll sort of get into this later, but. Um, the ideal case for Q functions, the really nice case of Q functions and state state um, act, state action state value functions, state action value functions, is that you have discrete you have a discrete observation space or a discrete state space, and you have a discrete action space, and then all you have to do is like create a big table of all possible states and action states and actions, and then you can just define probabilities for each action, and, and then it's it's very simple. Um, or it's it, it might require, but in some cases you have continuous values, like in this in this uh, box for this box observation space, where it's not going to take just one value for each, it, um, where it all different intensities for each pixel and each red, green, and blue. Um, and in that case, then well, you can't really create this nice little table. For every possible um, for every possible numerical value that it could take, that's just that, that would be too enormous, and that's not reasonable at all. So we have to use some sort of parameterized function instead for that. that. So if you have discrete cases, then you can actually do. Uh, it's pretty easy to do something like Q learning and epsilon greedy Q learning, but for um, but in a lot of cases, uh, often oftentimes the observation space is going to be uh, continuous. Um, and sometimes the action space is going to be continuous, although that's not as common. Um, anyway, so, and the last part was I just want to, well, for each of these examples, I was trying to print out the reward. In this case, the ball didn't hit anything. Um, oh, sorry. This is fairly important. Um, it is going to return the observation. It's going to return four values: the observation, which is your observation state or index or whatever you want to call it. It's going to return the reward, and it's going to return done, which is a. Um, I, if I, I mean, you can find this in uh, the OpenAI documentation, but it's. Um, I, I believe it's if it's finished or not, and info is some debugging information. The most important parts are going to be observation and reward, and this is this is the reward for each for that particular time step. So uh, I believe if you can see in this picture that it will say 31. 
well, so like I think that's the number of lives. Hopefully we can hit something. Okay, it's not hitting anything. But this this okay, these three zeros, it's the score. So if so if if it ever hits it and then hits back a block, it's going to get um, this score is going to increase by a certain value, and that's going to be the reward of that time step. But while the ball is like floating around, moving back and forth in, in space, the reward is going to be zero because you're not actually which at that particular time step you're not gaining any reward. So usually what if you're going to code this, you'll have to have some sort of total reward. Um, variable and you'll have to add the reward to the total reward. <laughs> Here's a, it's a, another example, and this is called, uh, it's a very popular one in reinforcement learning, it's called cart pull. Um, this is slightly bugged in that it was working before. Um, I, there should be only one of these, so I think it's clipping or or wrapping or something like that. Um, basically, you have a block and you have a pole on top of it. Okay, let me try to center this better. Okay, let me run this again. So you have a block and then you have a brown pole which is balanced on top of it and the block is going to move left and right. There's going to be momentum of the wooden pole on top and if you moved, I, I mean, if you want to if it's if a pole is falling over to the left, you have to like move your like your cart a little bit to the left in order to balance it out. And if you're if it's moving too far to the right, you can you have to move it um, to the right. But then if you do it too fast, it's going to gain too much momentum. So you have to uh, you have to control for that. Um, so this gives um, this is also uh, you can see here that we're using environment action space sample. So we're using it's just take it's just randomly moving uh, left and right. So it's not doing any sort of intelligent way of, um, of trying to balance it. Uh, I forgot what the word is actually, but but in um, some important, in uh, anytime you're using an environment, then it's probably, it's probably going to be helpful if you uh, know what observation space and action space you're using. Um, in this case, the observation space, uh, it's actually, so you'd think it would be, um, and for an Atari game, it would be all the pixels. But in this case, it's this is using, I believe it's using something like a Majoko physics simulator. And it, it the observation space is just going, it's, you can, you can completely determine it by, there, um, actually there should only be one cart, cart and one pole there, but it's only, you can complete, all the information you need is the position of the cart, the velocity of the cart, and then I believe the, angle of the pole and the angular velocity of the pole or something like that. So box four means it's a four dimensional rate and, um, and each of those um, variables that I mentioned are um, one dimension of, of that array. And the action space is actually, you can see that it is discrete too. So it's just, it's, it's purely, do you move left or do you move right? Um, so not very useful in this case. So I, I was pointing out the reward, not very useful in this case. I, for, I, I believe in this case, for a lot of these, um, you actually have a reward of, uh, let's say you're going to, um, get through a maze as fast as possible, or in this case, it might be, I want to balance my pole as long as possible. I think that's what the reward is in this case. And then usually you'll have a reward of like minus one based off, or maybe one based off of. So for each time step, you accumulate a reward. So you want to minimize, uh, you want to minimize the time that you that, or you want to maximize it. Oh yeah, so yeah, um, you want to maximize the time that you're balancing the pole. So for the last state, for each state, the reward is going to be exactly one. And if you if you do accumulate the reward of one for. 100 time steps, then your reward's going to be 100. And if you can do it 10 times as long, then your reward's going to be 1,000, and so on. Um, so that's usually what they use for these sort of problems, where they're just trying to do it as long as possible. For a robot, it might, it might be something like, it could be how far you can walk, but it could also be how long can you stand upright. Um, and um, so if you want to craft that sort of reward, you just, you would, um, you would create a reward of one for each second that you are running standing. Okay. 
Uh, let's see if there's any questions. Okay. Okay, we are good. Now, so the next example, so I want to share those examples. The first one's a fun little Atari environment, and the next one is, um, it was actually a physics simulator, so you could actually, uh, I don't remember what environments OpenAI has, but you could actually do some sort of robotic simulator if you have a robot with different joint angles, and you could try to, and they have, you, you can find, Actually, I believe they have these, and you can find little humanoid models of where they're trying to, they, they're teaching themselves to walk on their own. And so you can do these using these environments, although it's going to work. There's a lot more theory involved to create those. Um, um, I'm going to spend most of my time talking about this frozen lake environment because it's actually, um, it's creating a four by four grid. And what you're trying to do here is you, have a, you start at the starting point S, and um, F just stands for what you, uh, the idea is that you're, well, you're in the middle of a lake and you're trying to um, grab a Frisbee, or which is G, goal, where the Frisbee is located. And if part of the, of, the, of the lake, and H is a hole. So if you step in the hole, you fall down to your doom and you, and you die or whatever. Um, and you're, and basically, the idea is that you're trying to create a policy which will navigate, uh, I believe, as quickly as possible to like grab the frisbee. Um, and I don't, yeah, yeah. So you're trying to get to G without like falling into any of the holes. And the nice thing about this is that obviously it has the observations. It's just a four by four grid, so um, it's uh, it's a nice discrete space. And your actions are you just move left, right, up, or down. So it's also a purely discrete space. Um, to get back to this because I want to show off some other nifty environments. Um, this is, I have an extended version of Frozen Lake because I wanted to discuss how you can, um, well, I want to talk about, create an example for um, creating a state value function, a state action value function. Um, for now though, it's because I want to show um, well, this one's, well, it's, this is, this would basically be the game of Go, I believe. Okay, yeah. Example of the game of Go, I, I think they have some other board games too. And uh, as you can see, it's, the observation space is a, three by nine by nine, three. So the three is, it's, if there is no, if there's no squares in it, then it's gonna it's gonna be one value. Um, if there's um, it's, if there's a black square, it's gonna be another. It's gonna be it's gonna be one hot for another dimension. And the third dimension is is going to be if there's a white square. Um, and the action space is um, eighty three, and that and that means um, at each time step, one of the players has to move, and they're going to place a square onto one of the, um, well, it's 91 possible squares to, that you could put it on. And I believe there's some option about removing, like in the in the game of Go, if you surround things and you can remove a stone, so it might be something like that. And I think maybe the last option is pass. Um, something like that, but anyway. Um, and, Okay, yeah, so here. So here we're just going to iterate it five times and we're going to see that it's they're placing squares. So uh, black, white, black, white. Come on. So um, just an example how in OpenAI you can create Go games and I believe you can do chess and other things as well. Um, which. It's not as pretty, but in terms of, it's actually pretty impressive if you can create a, well, if you can create your own little AlphaGo, so your own attempt at something like AlphaGo using reinforcement learning. And this is Space Invader, is another popular game here. You control this uh, little green uh, thing that shoots projectiles, and you're trying to shoot these 
um, you're trying to shoot these little aliens which are coming down at you. Um, I think I had an example which ran for a little bit longer, but some initialization and then it's shooting. You can you might be able to see these little white dots coming down. Anyway, um, or if I didn't hit anything, the observation space. It's again, it's because it's a uh, it's um, it's a picture or it's an image. So it's a two ten by one sixty a targeting image with three colors and the discrete. I don't actually remember exactly, but it's something like you move left, you move right, and there's some combination of shooting and maybe some other options as well. So maybe there's three options for shooting. Maybe there's two different projectiles and, or you could shoot not there. Like if you shoot one projectile, the other one's mutually exclusive. So it's like left, right. So that's two times three possible actions of shooting or not shooting. Um, what is this here? And I was just trying to see in this case, I believe in this case, I was trying to test whether what the, what the reward was if you shot a specific alien. Um, and finally, here is the lunar lander example. And um, So I believe this is using, so Carpole, so before I mentioned Carpole was working and, but then it, for some reason it was wrapping in some weird way and Lunar Lander, I believe it's also, it might be using something like this physics simulator as well, um, because before there was only one rocket ship and it was dropping. Um, anyway, so you can see here that your, your, your goal, basically you're trying to fall into, in between the flags, I believe. And, um, you can angle your craft and, it, and, you, and you have a variable amount of thrust you can produce. Um, so here, uh, I forget, I don't remember what the rewards were, but um, this is the total rewards for the, this. And it might be something like uh, some combination of how close you got to the target and if you crashed or not. I believe if you crash, you get some huge negative reward. If you make it close to the target, then you get some sort of positive reward. Um, and once again, the question is, what is our observation space? And I think it has to do with the position of the rocket. And then the velocity, like the XY position of the rocket, the XY velocities of the, of the rocket, and the angle as well. And maybe something else. Maybe like there's angular momentum. Um, and the action space. Oh, yeah. So if you, play, if you ever play the Lunar Lander game, then you can press up down, left, and right, and, or maybe down does nothing. But anyway, so I believe you can press the different arrow keys up, down, left, and right. If you press left and you go left, you go right a little. And if you press up, then you, you use your booster and you float a little bit higher and down, maybe you like fall a little bit faster. Um, and um, so those were most of, and there's some other, and if you, so you imported, all the all the open AI environments and I, I think there is actually some sort of command we we're supposed to use at the that you're that, um, at the first line um, I believe in order for this to work for you guys um, so I've uh, I've shared object with so everyone can use it although I, I'll give out the more updated version but I believe for for we tested this last night and for, for use it then I think, I believe you'll have to enter this command on, you'll have to create a, at the very top, you're going to have to, before you do anything, you're going to have to like run this command, I believe. Um, although uh, I think Pankaj can explain it a little bit more. Um, Anyway, so, and I, I, I was doing some TensorFlow, well, I had some more extensive TensorFlow testing just to make sure that it was working properly. Um, but that, so we're using random policies and in the, in the, I believe next week, then we'll actually talk about using this in more detail. Um, but what we really want to do is that we want to take our observation and then we want to feed that into some sort of function 
and then use that to choose our action. So if playing Lunar Lander, or if we're playing a breakout or whatever, then we're gonna feed in we're gonna feed in the image and then we're gonna apply some function. In this case, it's helping it, it would probably be it. for a DQ one, it would be some convolutional neural network. And then we're gonna output like, well, do you move left or right based off of that? Um, and then and to do that, it's I mean, you have to create some large nonlinear functions. So you, and, I mean, and the easiest way to do that is, well, a simple, a quick way of doing that is TensorFlow because they have some nice, they, you don't have to write your own soft max functions. So uh, which I've done before, it's very painful. Um, but anyway, uh, sorry, let me see if there are questions. Oh, how is the stream quality, by the way? Mine is not very good. I'm hearing that you can uh, you can continue. I haven't heard of a problem on the on the live chat. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So I wanted to. I'm going to go back more into well, I for I'm about to go into this nice simple example where we're going to do the frozen lake, um, and I wrote up some more code for it. But let me go back to the slides. So anyway, so I went through these examples so we could see in each case that we're using pretty much the same command. We're using, we always call gym make, uh, we always call it re reset and feed that into an observation variable, but you can if you want to, like if you wanted to do a C, apply a C and then to choose the act. If you wanted a policy based off of the observation, then you're going to want to store the and that is returned by reset or by um, to choose the next action. And then rendering, if you want a picture, you don't have to do it, but it's it's nice to look at and it looks pretty cool. You have to choose some sort of action. Um, in each of these cases, we're using um, random, we're using completely random actions. But what, as I mentioned, the next step is, of course, is to use intelligent policies. Um, maybe based off of observations or through um, or through um, through the Q function or the or the uh, or through the value function. Um, so, uh, I guess I want to talk about Frozen Lake more, um, and I discussed this and. Um, there's there's a link to the environment in, op in OpenAI Gym, and you can find, like I mentioned before, here's a little picture of the grid, and S is the starting point, and there's a hole here, there's a hole here, there's a hole here, there's a hole here, and there's a goal. And the, the episode ends when you reach the goal or if you fall in a hole. And if you fall in the hole and you try to move, you don't move anymore, you're just stuck there. And yeah, the observation space is, so there's 16 possible values and the action space is four is a discrete space of four because you can move left right up or down and if you move well and i can I'll actually show you okay so, so we, we've shown just uh, just the initialization and the little orange clear where you are um, over here. And we're going to do it over five time steps and see what happens. Um, so let's see. And next five time steps, but I added in a few lines to print out the observation index and the action index so we can get a sense of exactly what's going on. This misspelling. Anyway, and one other thing which you might be able to get. Well, I'm going to run it first, and then help figure out what's. Oh, sorry, I need to. So it's because I didn't actually uh, writing the environment, so I need to set it back to frozen lake for this to work. Um, Anyway, so I'm going to run it for five time steps. 
and and we'll just go through what it, um, so here uh, the observation index uh, we start at our initial point and our observation index is zero and as you might be able to guess from from the little patterns here like next in the next time step the observation index is one and it's one to the right and the next observation index is five so so the index is um, it's like one zero one two three four, five, six, seven. So it's just going along row by row. And then once it reaches the end of the row, then increments it by going down one row and starting all the way back to the left. So uh, this is zero, one, two, three, four, five, this little hole here. Um, uh, anyway, so yeah, so this is five, this is five because you're stuck in the hole, five, you're stuck in the hole. And um, you, you can note that in each case, is it, it, after you're stuck in the hole, it's, it's trying to choose different actions. Uh, here it's going left, here it's going down, here it's going down, but it's stuck in the hole because you've, you're, you've fallen into the hole and you can't move anymore. So you're, you're sort of stuck and doomed. Um, in terms of the actions, well, we can probably try to, we can probably guess what each of these, what the action index means. So action two is right, Action zero is left. So remember the actions are zero, one, two, and three. Um, and action one is down, or action one is down, and up is going to be three. Um, which is, well, yeah. So what this didn't show was some other interesting behavior, which is, okay. I want for reasons which will hopefully become apparent. So. First of all, if, you, if you're at the border, what happens? Well, I'm at the border and I'm trying to go up and I can't go up, so I just return to the same state. I don't move at all. So I move from state zero to state zero. Here, I try to move left, can't move state zero. <clears throat> and now, here, um, some interesting behavior. Here, I my action index is two, which is right, but as you can see, I'm moving down. And why is that the case? Well, for frozen lake, it's actually a non-deterministic environment. So you're going to choose an action, and most of the time, with the probability of, let's say, p, you're going to move the direction that you the action the direction that you intended. So the probability of p, if you I, I would have moved right, um, I would yeah. Well, the probability of p, I would have moved right, but there's going to be some probably one minus p. I will move in a completely random direction, I believe. And so instead of moving right because it's slippery, I slipped and I, I moved down instead. So um, there's some stochasticity here. Um, you can see in the next in the next case, um, so I tried to move right, I went down instead. And, and then the next case, I, I tried to move right and into this hole, but first I slipped and I moved up instead. So that's an interesting thing about this environment that it's well. It's stochastic, so I can't move in the direction that I, that that I wanted to, and that academic, but it, it actually causes a slight problem for us, which I'm going to which I'm going to go over. Um, in act, it, so now I'm going to I'm going to try to manually move around the way I want to, and and actually there there is a command. In OpenAI Gym, where you can um, you can take human input, so you can play Space Invaders or Pong or whatever, and you can move uh, time steps. It'll ask you for input, and it'll stop, and you'll press that. You'll press whatever input, and it's going to take the action accordingly. Um, so you can actually play games yourself using. Um, or I believe this uses. I tried to do this. You know, I believe. It actually creates a little pop-up window, and Jupyter Notebook doesn't really support that very well. So I don't think you can do that as of right now. We can see if we can do something about that. Um, but it's more for it's more just an interesting thing you can do. And, and if you just want to run like a learning model, you don't really have to do it. Um, anyway, so instead of doing that, well, since now that I've known what the actions are, I can actually manually move around the way I wanted to. So here I'm, I, I'm decided I'm just going to make a, I'm going to action. So I'm going to move 
Um, so I'm going to reset the environment. So I'm going to start in this initial square S again, which will show, show my initial picture. And I'm going to choose action zero. I'm going to move left, take the step. Then I'm going to move down. Um, I'm going to choose action one, which is going to move down, take the step. And I'm going to move up, take the step. And I'm going to move right and take the step. And that's the way it intended. And it sometimes because, of course, it's stochastic. So as you can see here, um, we tried to move left, and then we got the slippery uh, slippery behavior and we moved down instead. OK, and now we tried to move down. And yes, it went down as we intended. And now we try to move up. And nope, it looks like uh, it tried to, we told it to move up. Stayed in the same place, so we tried to move left instead, and just and because of that, it stayed in the same place. And finally, we tried to move right, and instead of right, we moved up. So that's the slippery part again. For we don't always move in the direction that we intended, and that's the frozen part of it. Um, is this why? Why was this so annoying to me? Like, what, why did I spend all this time pointing this out? It's because in, op in, in OpenAI, Jim, there is no option for, uh, so you can return the observations, but I believe you can't set the state. You can't manually set the state. Like ideally, um, and I, I'll actually go back to the slides and explain this, but what, what we want to do is that we want to estimate the, the value for each possible so we can or also the state action value for each possible action and each possible state. And we can't do that unless, well, it, it's sort of difficult to do. The, the ideal way to do that is to be able to say, okay, let's say, and now we're gonna do simulations from there. We're gonna, we're gonna define a policy and we're going to run the policy starting at this time square and we're gonna do it like, we'll, we'll average the result and that'll be our average reward. All right, that, that'll be the average value for our that state for that state. We do that because we can't set that. Um, we can't set that. We can't tell the environment particular state. And so, um, after some thinking, and that was pretty annoying. Well, well, first of all, what they actually do is they do something called experience replay, well, where they'll store experiences, and. Um, Event, and the hope is that eventually, well, if you do, if you have a algorithm with some amount of randomness, then eventually you should be able to reach certain states um, if you do it enough times, and then you can like, and then you can get predictions. You can run simulations. You can um, you can run a policy and then um, reach a state. Uh, look at the times where you reach a state that you that you desired, and then just evaluate the maybe take all those examples and then bootstrap that and then form some sort of um, estimate for the value function. Um, but, uh, so you can store that information and usually they call that experience play buffer. The problem though is that frozen lake, if you have like a pretty bad policy or maybe an overly good policy, you may not reach, you may not visit certain squares or you may not visit them Especially if there are further, if there are a lot of hazards in the way that, like, sort of terminal states where you can't move any further, like those holes, then you're just going to be stuck at that square and certain squares, and it'll be hard to move to like the squares which are further past that. So you'll probably see a large. You'll if you run simulations, you'll probably see lots of lots and lots of uh, examples where you you reach like the nearby squares, but you'll see very few examples where you you reach like. Um, the bottom, the bottom row, or um, maybe this square right above the goal. So that's going to be. That means that you're far enough. But then, if you if you want to, it it makes things more difficult because you don't have enough data data early on. So your your estimates will be inaccurate um, because you don't have enough of them. Um, but anyway, so so. My solution was that, okay, well, why don't I, um, I'm just gonna try to move directly. Since I can't set the, these observations or states directly, I'm just gonna move directly. I'm just gonna program it to move directly to the square. Uh, but the problem is it's, um, so let's say I want to move 
two two squares to the right and two squares down, then I would just move, uh, take action. I, I think it was like two, two, and then one, one, something like that. But the problem is this this annoying stochasticity of the frozen lake uh, model. It means I'm gonna like I'll be I I'll try to move two. I might tell it to move two, but it's not in in a lot of cases it's not gonna end up where I want it to. So I the stochasticity will present will prevent me from uh, setting the observation state that I intended, and which was an annoying problem. Um, so. Oh, but I well, let's say I really want to do this just so I could show it some examples of the of the state value function and the state action value function, uh, which is my intention for this um, or for this um, session. And and what you could do is that if you look at if you look at the open the code, there is actually um, well, yeah. So. If you look at the frozen lake people, they ask for the initialization, it has a tag for is slippery. Is slippery is, um, determines whether it's well deterministic or if it's stochastic, whether you slip and move randomly or if you always move in the, in the direction that you intended. So, um, that you said online, uh, well, what you can do is you can create a new environment. Um, for my purposes, what I did was I created this a new frozen lake environment called frozen lake not slippery, um, and I set the argument for is slippery to false. So now I will always move in the direction that I intended. Um, so let's see what am I doing here? So I'm going to create this new environment, and then I'm going to uh, okay. So and now what I'm doing here is I'm going I'm going to move in a uh, a predefined um, I'm going to move in a predefined trajectory. A trajectory is, um, well, it, it's a set of states and actions that you've taken. Um, let's move to the next square. So anyway, so, um, and remember before I just, well, just to save time, instead of saying action equals, setting action equal to one or left, right, up or down, I just put it, I just remember that environment step can take the action directly. So I just inputted, um, I just told it to go right, and then uh, I believe left, right, left, and then no zero is left. So right, down, left, and then uh, down, right, and then up. I think so. Right, down, left, down, right, up. Yeah, just like I said. And let's see if it actually moves the terminus expected. And let's see. We told it to go right. Move right. Let's go down. And we move down and note that we're stuck in this stupid little hole. So like we're we're in the ice and we're trapped and we're, we're so we tried to move left, we're stuck, we tried to move down, we're stuck, we tried to move right, we're just stuck, and we've tried to move down and we're stuck again. Um, but it is so it is moving, I mean we can it is moving exactly the way that we want to. And uh, then I decide to create my own little set observation function and there's much more clever ways to do this but i just decided uh, because i want to save time and do more uh, I, I sort of want to save time so i just i just manually define the path to take to each a particular um, um i just told, so um i just defined a function where i reset it to the initial state and let's say if i move one to move to one i told it to move one square to the right and so on so i define this function and then, um, then I just tested this function to see if it moves. Let's 14. So this is and move to where I want to. Let's say 15. Move to where I want to. Uh, let's say a three, seven, nine. Let's try nine. Oh, okay. Oh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Oh, okay. Nine. It moved here. And this should be a left G. Should be a eleven. Um, okay, so so I define a function that moves to where it wanted to, and the idea behind this is that if you want to, well, um, if you want to do Monte Carlo simulations, what you have, um, you need to get to whatever state you want to evaluate. 
Um, you can also use experience replay, like I mentioned. And then after that, now that I've gotten to the state, what I could do was I could, um, I stopped after this point because they're we're working on some bugs. But um, at this point, now that I've gotten to the state, I can define my policy or, or actually um, I can, I can I can evaluate I can do a an empirical evaluation of my of of the value of each state and given a policy and the state action and the value of each action or state action based off of the policy and um, so you go to that whatever observation state that you're interested in and then you can just do uh, you can define your policy and you can just tell the act you can define the action as policy of observation like um, some policy function based off your observation so it could be something like uh, so it would be something like action is equal to policy it could be like frozen lake policy which I'm not I didn't define here but and then observation and then it would return that and then you can do environment um, and you can do observation reward Observation reward um, done info is equal to, uh, and then action. So, um, and then you can run that for like however many steps, um, some for loop, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then based off of that, oh, and you'd have some sort of like total rewards function. Uh, you, you set that equal to zero, and then um, reward, total rewards, reward, and then you, you can use that, and then you can use this to as like a, some sort of like cute, some state value, some b function, some value, some function b based off of observation, um, and like maybe some policy. Policy parameters, and then you'd return, um, and this would return like the total, or and then you you do. I, I and I guess there'd be some other thing where you you just run this like, oh, that's weird. Anyway, run a whole bunch of times in average. And then I guess at the very end, you'd return like total rewards. And that's how you'd get your um, state value function. And do something similar for uh, uh, for your state, for your, your Q function, which is going to be your action, your state action value function, where you take, you're at a certain, you pick an observation state, and then you define some sort of action that you want to move for the first, at, at the observation, and then you do the same thing, like, and so on. Yeah. So you can define your, and you can use that. And this is this is a. They call this a Monte Carlo rollout. Um, Monte Carlo is when you you create when you do the estimates just by um, running simulations over and over again. So you this is a Monte Carlo rollout of the of the value function, the state action value function. Um, and uh, I, I actually I wish that I had if I had a bit more time and maybe I'll I'll, I'll actually create an example where it does that for frozen lake I'll, I'll feed that in I'll define a policy and then give you the state uh, the state value function the state action value function um, but I've been talking about these concepts for a while and the question is well uh, well, well, what are these state value functions and state action value functions? Oh, yeah, and I will be repeating this, I believe, on Wednesday as well, and maybe with a little bit more information for people who couldn't make it, if you guys need more clarification. Um, let me look if there's, let me check if there's any non-technical questions. It looks like we're good. Um, yeah, so let me, I, I've been talk. Yeah, I, I realize I've been mentioning things like Markov decision processes and state 
uh, value functions and action, state action value functions. And uh, that's not, a, if you don't know what those are, that, that's going to be kind of confusing, which is why I wanted to keep it. That's why I wanted to focus on that simpler model where we had just the environment. Uh, where is that picture? Um, because it's, um, now that I've given a lot of examples, we know, we pretty much know exactly what's, or we should know um, what's going on in each of these cases. We have the environment with the observation space, and then um, the, we have their, our agent, and we take our actions, which isn't listed here, and we get a reward. So like we, this is all we've seen directly, and we, we can actually play around with the open environments now that um, through the cabinet. And, and and have direct experience with what each of these means and we know and we um, we've seen examples of how to get each get well get, how to get the observations how to get the rewards and how to take these steps given a certain action um, so um, in order to the next part is actually going to well I'm not gonna talk about this too long but well the next step would be to well what is the state value function and what is this state action value function and I I need to give some sort of background on that so um, we mentioned something called a Markov decision process and what a Markov decision process is is that you have um, you have so first of all I believe I mentioned okay yeah here it is um, so Here's an example, which is in the David Silver lectures, and I, and I, I can give a link for that um, in, the, in the channel. Well, so David Silver is worked at is the um, works works at DeepMind, and he is um, he taught at uh, UCL University of College London uh, this reinforcement learning course. Chat and um, it's, it's a great introduction to reinforcement learning. Uh, they have um, okay, where is this? Uh, I should put it in the comments. All right. It doesn't like web addresses, but anyway, I'll find some other way to link it. But basically, yeah, if you um, David Silver reinforcement learning, and it, it has all of these. I believe these are the powerpoints, all these lectures, and you can also find them on YouTube as well. Um, for some reason, this loads very slowly, so uh, you can actually go to um, there's U the UCL, the University of College London 2000. So that was his 2015 course. There's a 2016 course taught by a different guy named Hado van Hasselt, but the, the slides are pretty much the same. They changed some of the orders, like I believe they moved exploration and exploitation from near the end to towards the beginning, but it's pretty much the same slides. And um, are useful because for some reason, a David Silver um, page it takes forever to load, so this is a lot faster. So if you're if you're pressed on time, you can just download from this instead and just watch the videos of David Silver. So it's, it's the same thing. Um, th this is an example called the student Markov decision process, um, and. Um, and so we have a certain amount of states. Um, and so we see the student, they begin at class, they're sitting in class one. What their actions are, they could go to the, they could take an action and have to, um, they could take two actions. And half the, <coughs> I'll check Facebook. And if they ever, um, when they're ch checking Facebook, then if you, there's a high degree um, of chance that if you're checking Facebook, you'll continue to check Facebook. So there's, so we can see um, these are the um, the action probabilities. So um, half the time the student decides to check Facebook, and then point ninety percent of the time, Facebook he's going to continue to check Facebook, and then ten percent of the time he's going to start paying paying attention to class again, um, and then um, and half the time, the other half the time when he's not checking Facebook, he's going to like actually pay enough attention that and then he'll move on to the next class class two and 20% um, of the time he'll go to sleep after that class and 80% of the time he'll pay enough attention that he'll go to class three 
Um, and since, since this is University, University of College London, there is, um, they like to go to the pub afterwards. So um, time, they'll decide to, um, after their third class, they're going to go to the pub with all their classmates and, and just, I guess, start drinking. And um, then different outcomes could, ha could happen. They could forget so much that they have to go back and like to class one again, or they could go back to class two, or they could go back to um, uh, where they ended class three in terms of their knowledge. Um, so if they drink too much, maybe 20% of the time they're going all the way back and 40% of the time they're, they remember some of it so they can get back into class two and 30% um, of the time they, they, um, uh, they, they're, they're at the same state as at the end of class three. And of course, once they're at, once they're at that state, they decided they might decide to go back to the pub again and just keep cycling here, um, which is possible. Um, and but the other 60% of the time, okay, they've paid enough attention. They haven't, um, um, they can now pass the course. And once they pass the course, now they will always because they're tired and um, they, they've had enough. Remember, there's another option at, at the end of class two. Their, their brain was just too um, heavy and they just decide to sleep even though they didn't um, completely absorb all the information they needed to. So they just went to sleep early. So this is David Silver's example called the student Markov decision process. Um, so see that uh, we have our, our states, our states here. So what, what, uh, what the student is doing at the time. Um, and we have our actions. What is this called? Okay. I don't know what the sound is. Okay, anyway, um, I'm gonna keep moving on and ignore the strange no noise. Um, we have another case called the Markov reward process, which is, so we, we talked about reinforcement learning, I mean, we have states and we have actions, um, but then we also have rewards as well. And um, so in, in, in this example, we also define rewards for, for each time step. And this isn't, this, these are incremental rewards. So they're not total, acu total accumulated rewards. So you can see here that like, um, if you, so um, penalty for spending time, I guess. And if you're on Facebook, then you, I guess you waste some, some cycle of time. So you, you lose one and then you move on. I guess if you spend enough time to uh, finish class one, then you, you lose two. So you move on to the next class and some amount of time, um, you lose some amount of reward for the time you spent and you move on to class three and so on. So the same amount for each time. And if you go to the pub, you lose time, but I guess you're also, you enjoy yourself. So there's some, you feel a little bit better about yourself. There's some net positive reward from that, um, of plus one. But then of course you're still sort of stuck here. Um, you're, you still have to complete class three. And if you pass the course, then you're very happy and you've, you're now on your way to um, becoming a, um, to working in the industry or whatever, being in academia or doing your research projects, and you get a huge reward of plus 10. Um, and if we went to sleep early, then, well, we didn't actually get this, lose anything, but then um, we didn't pass the class, and so we're still sort of stuck. So, um, so it's, so we just get a reward of zero. And, let me see if that sound was something completely different. So the Markov decision process. Anyway, so I want to talk a little bit more about that. And it is, is that we talked about histories, but the one important property of Markov decision process is that it is memoryless. That is, that the state contains sufficient information that the previous states don't matter for determining future states and rewards. Um, and by that, I mean that, well, if I check Facebook five times, then maybe there's some increased chance that I'm going to go back to class. But in this case, we're going to say that once you've 
work state, it doesn't matter what you've done before. It doesn't matter if you uh, went here, went here, and then went to the pub and had to go back to class one, and you did that like three times, and you went to Facebook, and then you, and then you like cycled like ten times. No, it, the, or if you just got there directly the first time. The only thing that matters is that you once you've gotten to Facebook, that 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 has to determining your next action. Um, and in that may not sound that realistic um, because, well, if you've had to, if you went through this cycle a whole bunch of, if you went through one of these cycles a whole bunch of times, then maybe you could say, well, now my rewards have changed or maybe I'm running out of time in the day. But in this case, we're ignoring that. Um, in the example of Atari games, it could be that, um, well, let's say you take an observation but then just one frame of an observation, but then break out and you, there's a, you, you, we can see the ball moving in the middle of the screen. Oh, hello. Uh, 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 okay. So yeah, so let's say it's breakout and let's say the ball is somewhere. And um, if we just saw this frozen frame, like, well, we don't know which direction the ball is moving. So that's actually not enough information. So we might need several frames of information in order to, in order to determine like what the state is. Like maybe, so maybe if we have the last four frames, well, we, we have the information of the score here and how many lives we have left. So maybe we don't have to know the entire history of all our movements. Uh, just like if we're walking or if we're driving a car, some additional information than, than some snapshot of what we're seeing at the time. We, uh, if we're at a traffic light, then maybe we have to um, sort of remember like what was going on maybe five seconds before. Um, but then at the same time, you don't need to know what happened for your entire drive up to that point. That's probably a little bit overkill. Um, so, uh, you just need to have your state might just be some short summary of, of the previous observations, but hopefully once you have, um, okay, once that information, so the state might be, uh, just like what I mentioned before, your, your state might be the entire history of state actions and rewards. Um, but in, so a specific time frame of visual time frame information, but it, it could be all the time, all, all the snapshots that, and all and a knowledge of all the actions that you've taken. But and that's that's more that hope that's sufficient for your eight date, but you don't need all that information. So hopefully you could condense that into something uh, um, simpler. And one way, of course, one way of doing this, if you if you're familiar with uh, recurrent neural networks, is that you create some sort of hidden state variable um, based off of um, <coughs> um, based off of your observations. And what you can do is you can all I guess it would be something like. Um, you feed in your previous hidden state, you feed in your observation, and, you, you've, and um, that will give you, I don't think you need your action. But anyway, you can, what you can do is that you can feed in your previous, you can feed in your, your hidden state, and you can feed in your previous observation. You can combine that into some new summary of your hidden state. And you can use your hidden state as a summarization of all of your observations up to that point. Um, that's, um, I mean, that's the basic idea of, uh, recurrent neural, net neural networks if they, assuming they have enough capacity to do that. Um, and as I mentioned before in Atari games, we can, we can concatenate the previous four observations and hopefully that will, um, and oftentimes that gives us enough information and our state to, to give us enough information for a proper memory list state. Um, and this, we don't have, mathematically, this is theoretically pretty important in terms of um, the discussion of MDPs. And you can actually learn more about this 
uh, either through various resources on Markov chains, but also I believe I can share a, a book for Sutton, David, for Sutton's book. And I think the second or first or second chapter discusses MDPs. Um, but in usually in the mathematical formulation, what you have is the usual mathematic dis mathematical discussion is that you have some sort of transition matrix from one state to a different state. Um, and uh, for example, in, in this student case, there's a uh, each of these. So what you could do, you would create a matrix of one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You'd have a matrix of length of or, or, or sorry, seven by seven matrix. And if you're um, in each, each position would be uh, whatever state you're in. So if, and if you start at state in the Facebook state, then your probability of going from, uh, let's say this is state zero, 90% 90, 90 transition probability from going state zero to state zero. There's a 10% uh, chance of going from state zero to state one. And there is, of course, a 0%, even though, so technically you can define these as zero any of these other states. And we can do this for each, um, and you could write, and you could write this out and create a seven by seven tr um, tr um, transition matrix. And what you could do is that given any, so you could feed in some one hot vector of the state, or you could do some sort of um, distribution of the states. And in order to figure out the state, um, let's say n time steps from now or 10 time steps from now, all you'd have to do is uh, n time over um, through matrix multiplication. And that would give you the, the distribution, the probability to distribute, well, that would give you a vector of uh, states um, n time steps from now. Mathematically, this is very nice and clean. And of course, um, for work, it has to be memoryless. Um, um, because if, if, it do, if it did, because if it did in the state that you're in, then this is not going to work um, because there'd be some sort of conditional elements. Conditional on any of the previous information, off any information other than your state, then this would work. Just, um, so this is great mathematically. Um, it, you think, oh, wow, this is a very simple way of doing things. Um, and actually, uh, they call this in, in reinforcement learning, if you do know this transi transition matrix P, they, they call it, uh, they call that the dynamics of the model and you can call, um, and you can do model-based reinforcement learning with dynamic programming. Um, but the drawbacks are that realistically, uh, or in many situations, like those Atari games when you have pixel observations, uh, and let's say you're combining four, like 210 by 160 by three uh, pixel ob observations together and co co concatenating four of those together, then you're going to have, that's an enormous matrix. That's um, some very large number because you have to do state number of states by the number of states. And it's going to be, um, and of course, there, it, th those aren't, um, that's, that's assuming that the, the that the, like the had um, well, there is like for each um, for each pixel intensity for each color. So like that would be way too many states. So uh, and that's computationally just ridiculous. So it's not realistic in in many cases. So it, you know, as I mentioned before, we're often better off using parameterization and running simulations and trials like these Monte um, like the Monte Carlo simulations that I mentioned before for the frozen lake. Um, so a lot of talking about Markov decision processes, they're pretty, if you're not comfortable with them, like, well, hopefully, I mean, just, uh, but eventually you'll get more and more familiar with them and it's used a lot. Um, um, I think it, it's not too, not that bad once you're familiar with it. Um, but the next thing is that if you have a value function or sorry, um, the next step is. Uh, a value function, and what we what we mean by there is, um, well, we have this Markov decision process, and we actually want to do something useful. And we can, and one thing that we can do is that we can define, um, based off of what state we're in, of um, some some, 
And let's say we know the probabilities of moving from one state to another state, or these, we can call these actions, some, so some action probabilities. Um, so if we know these probabilities, then we can actually estimate, we, we can evaluate the value for each state. So given whatever state we're in, we can, um, I was thinking of something else, but, um, oops. Given what state we we're in, we can we can determine the value function for that state. For example, in this last in, in this last state here, um, the numbers look weird to me, and I and I fully remember and I remember why. So in this this example, it's fully discounted, which means we talked about the discount factor gamma. In this case, we this picture has gamma equal to zero, which means that we're discounting so we care about this first reward but we're going to ignore we're going to multiply all future rewards by zero so basically we go here we'll get a reward of minus two but then we're going to add on all future rewards but then it's going to be zero times 0 0.8 times minus two times blah 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 um so actually it's just going to, our state value function is just going to be whatever the reward is um, it just you get a reward of minus two, uh, you get a mi reward of minus one for being in the state, and so on. It's not particularly interesting. Um, on the other, on the other full, it's not discounted at all. Um, so that means that that we're just going to add up all future rewards. Um, and the question is, what is the value of each state? And this value function, it's it's useful. It's, it's some sort of Given a policy, we can, once you're in this state, then we could say, well, what is our expected future rewards? And uh, the definition of, of that, that's the value function or the state value function. And the counterpart of the state action value function, which is given that we're in the state and we take a certain action, then what is, um, what is our expected future rewards? Um, for the value function, um, so, here we can see the values are different because so um, remember in this last case we saw that okay once we once we've passed our course then we're going to get uh, a value of ten in this case we see something similar we get once we pass the course then we're, we get this value of ten so it ha it hasn't changed in either case however we can see if we look here in this case it's minus this value function is minus two in this case it's four point three so this four point three it accounts for um, um, what it means is that it's it, it's going to add uh, so and you're going to get a reward of 10 and then you reach your terminal state and you don't get any future rewards so it's going to be 60 percent times 10 which is six or it's going to be minus two so you get a reward of minus two for being in the state and then you add for 60 percent of the time you get this value of 10 and then um 40 percent of the time you're going to um go to the pub and you're gonna get a reward of plus one. Um, so it's gonna be 0. 0.4 times, and then, um, but then you have to, um, basically you have to figure out, you have to uh, work out the probabilities. Okay, now I go here and then I get some, here with the probability of a reward of here of minus two and so on, or I get a, a reward of, minus two and then I have to continue this. So if I continue, if I go to here and I continue to um, do this uh, and, and I uh, continue like running my policies, my whatever predetermined policies for uh, the probabilities for uh, whatever action I could take, then eventually if I average all that out, then my the value is going to be 4.3. And similarly, um, uh, this 1.5 is based off minus 2 plus um, 0.8 times um, this. Now, the thing is, well, you could say, well, that sounds, how am I supposed to, like, do this ad infinitum? Because that's that sounds, that's, 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 that's way too much work. Um, but actually, functions, you can make an approximation, which is based, um, well, there's something, well, we talked about the Bellman equation, and, and, act, and 
so um, I should probably, it's probably important enough that I can commit. I should have a slide for this. Anyway, it's a sort of ugly version. But anyway, it's that for your value function, it's going to be um, like the reward plus um, like the value function for the next the discounted uh, the, the beta is gamma, but the, the beta is the, is the discount factor gamma in this case, but it's going to be something like the value function is equal to, um, well, this is discounted future rewards, but the development equation is, it's going to be uh, rewards plus discount times the value function of the next step. Um, well, times some, the, the action probability. I'm making it sound more confusing, but, um, but anyway, um, yeah, hopefully I can, I'll do this a little bit better next time. The, 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 the David Silver lecture, they, they go, they go over this example in a little bit longer, um, but, um, it should be a little bit clearer. Um, but basically the idea is that if I want to figure out the value, this value function, then, um, all I have to do is add the reward plus probability times discount times the value function of this. And then similarly, prob probability plus 0.4 times, um, times the value function of this. And, um, if, um, and you can, um, I, I think you, you can solve for this. Once you solve for the correct value functions, then it's going to be consistent with itself and, um, and it works out. Um, and also, so the equation allows you to, uh, well, you can iteratively, you can iteratively solve it so that you have this, a value function which satisfies, um, which is consistent and or you could just run a, like a Monte Carlo simulation, which would do the exact same thing, um, which I guess is more important for our interests. Uh, the state action value, and um, that was a value function. The state action value function, it's very similar. It, it is, and as I mentioned, um, instead of, um, it is, this is smaller. It, it is going to be, um, given that I'm at a certain state, I'm going to take a certain action. In this case, my action here for Facebook is that I go back to I go back to looking at more Facebook. In this case, watch what, looking at Facebook, and I go back to paying attention to class, focusing on the actions that I'm taking. And once I've once I've taken these actions, then uh, it's it's evaluating the future the my future returns based off of not the state that I'm in, but, but the action that I've taken. Um, in this case, it, it doesn't look, it looks like very similar to, um, this looks very similar to just the value function. And that's because, uh, well, that's because I, I believe, oh, it's because this, it's more sort of more deterministic in terms of, um, you're going like you could decide to uh, study here, and you're always going to go to the next class. But in, in a stochastic case, you might decide the study action. But just like in the frozen Atlantic example, you won't always end up the, where you intended. You might actually study, but then you decide you end up in the pub instead or something like that. Um, and that is. Um, so that's it's it's the the key is that uh, well I can hopefully there's some formula on this but uh, didn't want to get into too many formulas but so this is a value function um, element op optimality.
I mean, well, I'm trying to summarize a very large amount of information um, in a small amount of time while leaving up details. But, um, but basically, you're given a certain state, given a certain state, and choosing a certain action. The question is, what is my expected future returns? What is my expected future rewards? Um, and that is a state action value function. And like I said, what you could do is that, um, like in the data cabinet example, this may have, uh, I think this may have tied out because after a certain amount of time, it might, it, it tends to close. But um, if I've, um, sorry, in the frozen lake example, I go to a certain square. Um, and then I decide to move to the right. That's my action. And the question is, given that I'm in space, that I'm, I'm on that square and I take a certain action, what is my... And that is a state action value function. And just like this to do Monte, a Monte Carlo simulation, but instead of just starting from that observation and then taking an taking a number and considering um, that, that I could take from that from the observation from that states I could take I'm just taking one specific action and then um, and then I'm, I'm, def, I'm determining my expected future return from um, from that action um, so that's somewhat confusing, or it, that's probably somewhat confusing, and I apologize for that. It's it's kind of hard to cover uh, in a short amount of time. Um, but I wanted to, I, I in this, in the, um, for this for this lecture or workshop or whatever you want to call it, that uh, I want to talk about Q learning, and so for Q learning. The state action value function is called a, it's often called a Q function. And what this means, well, the idea behind it for Q learning is this, is that, is, it's that if I know, um, yeah, I'll, I'll cover it more in a bit more depth, but I guess maybe next time, but I just want to give just the general idea behind it. Let's say I know this, State action value function. So I know for any for any state that I'm in, and then any action, and for any action that I study or Facebook, I know um, what the future, what my expected reward is for that action. Let's say it's like here minus two point three. So what I can do is that given all those options, I can say, well, I'm going to, I can be. Let's take the best possible action. So greedy, let's create a new, let's create a policy which is based off of our state action value function where we pick our greedy, where we pick, where we greedily pick the best action. So in this case, um, the best action for, um, for if you're in class one, you could go to Facebook, but then actually all that does is it, it, it just loses you uh, um, in terms of expect Difference, you you lose rewards, but if you study, you gain rewards. Like three to two, um, well, two point seven. So this 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 studying is worth two point seven. So I'll say so because I'm um, I'm going to optimize. I'm, I'm going to say well, I will. I'm going to just pick studying because that gives me the most rewards. And then um, uh, a harder example is let's say I'm I've I'm working through class three. Go to the pub, and that's worth plus one. Or maybe it's worth more than plus one. You could say, "Well, that's good. That's 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 worth something." Um, should I do that, or should I study instead? Now, word for studying is lower. There's some chance that you might fail if even if you study. So, um, based off, if you have, if you know the state action value function, you can compare the uh, the value for. You can you can compare the value, the q the q value for study for going to the pub. You can compare it to the Q value for studying, and you can just decide which one's higher. 
Um, in this case, it would be studying. So the policy is that I'm going to be greedy and maximize my future reward. So I will not go to the pub and I will study instead. In this case, it's it's fairly obvious. But in other cases, like if you're playing Go or something, um, they actually use. I mean, in, in reinforcement learning, they, they they are using value functions. So what they're doing is that you're you given a certain pol you 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 start with a certain policy. Um, which is given a certain state, and then you you about you determine the state action value function based off that policy, and you decide to be greedy about it. You create a new policy based off of greed. So it means best possible action, the best possible action based off of our state action value function, um, and that's base learning is you just do that process iteratively you, you take your state action you take a max over all possible actions and that's your new um that's your new greedy policy um for q learning and and i i can hopefully i can show a notebook example of that um and the last detail for that is that for q learning well we actually have to do some just like well we want to do some we don't actually want to be greedy all the time we want to have some amount of exploration because we might our, we, our initial estimate or our initial policy may not explore enough. Like we might just sort of, um, for the frozen lake, maybe we just go right all the time. And maybe that's a really dumb policy, but we're not gonna be able to move the rest of the space. So what we'll do instead is that uh, most of the time with a probability of one minus epsilon, where epsilon is a small number, we're going to be, be greedy. And the rest of the time, with a probability of epsilon, we're not. Go we're going to take a completely random action, and this will give us sufficient exploration if we uh, run simulations enough. And that is called well, that's called epsilon greedy learning. That for a Q function, and that's um, when for papers like the, the most famous, um, the well-known paper for uh, well, one of the most well-known reinforcement learning deep for Q learning is, is called DQN. It was done by Atari Games by Min at I think at DeepMind, and it uses a what I talked about Q learning, but it, it has some other tricks involved because it's working with a uh, continuous space instead of a discrete space. So it doesn't it won't for for a frozen lake we can we can make it we can get it to work fairly nicely, but for something like Atari Games then it doesn't work nearly. You have to do some tricks because Q learning works well. Like this, this maximization it works if you can define every state and every action. But for um, but like what I mentioned for for a lot of Atari games, for continuous spaces, so you can't define state and every action. So you have to do some sort of parameter. Um, um, the, D, the DQ one. Well, that and experience replay are the basis of the D, of the DQN algorithm. Um, and hope more later in with some better examples. But I guess that's uh, mostly what I want to cover for now. Uh, I apologize if there is any fully. Um, you guys can, um, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. And um, I guess we can wait a little, or I can give it back to Pankaj, or I could, and I can listen in for questions and we could try to answer them. Um, we can try to um, help with both technical questions and, I guess, more theoretical questions. Cool. Thanks, Alex. And uh, uh, we will send you uh, the links to the uh, YouTube video. Uh, this will be recorded. And, uh, the, and we'll again send you um, send you the links to Data Cabinet Project. And also, uh, we will do a repeat of this uh, same lecture on Wednesday. Uh, and uh, hopefully, hopefully we will we'll not encounter mo most of the issues we encountered today. Uh, the video will be better, and it will be easier to import. And uh, uh, yeah, we'll wait for some questions. And uh, if you have any questions about Data Cabinet, feel free to ask. and. Uh, um, we'll keep uh, providing better, uh, better lectures and uh, learning opportunities in future, and we'll uh, keep keep an eye on our emails. Thank you.
yeah, if there are any questions or if there's any feedback, then uh, uh, we'd be happy to hear it. Cool. If there is none, then we'll, uh, we'll stop this uh, broadcast. And uh, uh, thank you all for attending. And thanks, Alex. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll meet again on Wednesday. Okay. All right. All right.